Okay, so um, Gail and Dakota, thank you for being, you know, on this kind of uh, emergency broadcast. Uh, I wanted to talk <laughs> about three three concepts that that I think will be important to add to your database, Dakota, and it will touch on the issues I see with mass vaccinations and misinterpret interpretation from the truther community when, it, when they talk about the gray goo and um, potential issues with antibody dependent enhancement. So the three categories are that I wanted to touch is the ADE, the antibody dependent enhancement, the, the syncytia, which is the multinucleated cells that merge together either through um, a, 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 the natural infection of SARS-CoV-2 or through vaccines. And then I wanna talk about the Hoskins effect. All right, so let me start with, let me start with the Hoskins effect. The Hoskins effect is when we get exposed to a virus or a vaccine, we build, we, we, through our adaptive immunity, we get, we develop antibodies to a certain epitope but it's based on the original infection. So this is part of the reason why the Spanish flu happened. Ones in the late 1800s had the particular epitope, but were exposed to a particular epitope. They think it was from a horse and, and a, a chicken. So it was these individuals that were living on the farm. So they were, you know, they were younger at that time, but fast forward to, 1918, those individuals already had memory B cells and they did not get as severe infections and, and developed the pneumonia that actually killed most of the, of the individuals during the Spanish flu of 1918. The generation right after them, so, you know, we're talking about 1890 to, you know, 1910, right? These individuals were exposed to a different, a different influenza. I believe it was H3N3, but I could be wrong with the numbers. It doesn't matter what the numbers are. It's just a different, a different influenza virus. And so when 1918 came around, the ones that did not have their original uh, exposure to H1N1, they ended up dying from from the Spanish flu, the majority of them, you know, started dying from the Spanish flu because they had antibodies, memory B cells of a different version of influenza than what was spreading around in the, in the world. But the ones that were older, the older generation uh, in 1918 had memory cells from a previous infection and therefore fared far better. All right, this is what's called the Hoskins effect, where your original exposure locks your uh, immune system into producing or activating your memory B cells, even if you're exposed to a different epitope, a different version of the virus. And so your, your body has a tendency to lock in and just keep on creating the uh, activating the memory B cells and not activating naive B cells to create new types of antibodies to the new epitope. So this is the Hoskins effect. Now, how does it, how does that relate to what's going on in, you know, the world that we're living in SARS-CoV-2? If the Hoskins effect is taking place or will take place in this crisis, mass vaccinations to only one epitope is extremely dangerous because it locks everybody in to just one epitope. And it doesn't allow for a, a kind of a heterogeneous um, mixture of different antibodies that are tooled for, for different epitopes or different variants, you know, like Delta or Alpha or Gamma. We're all Everyone that's getting the vaccine, we're getting we're we're getting the S1 subunit from the original Wuhan strain. So we we 
maybe marching into this, this danger zone that if a variant deviates enough from the original epitope, and maybe Delta it is it, or Delta plus, or Delta plus plus, or some other variant, we, we, if we get exposed, even the vaccinated or the originally infected, we'll just keep on activating the memory B cells and, and not be able to truly fight the infection. Well, if that takes place, then you're going to start having the cytokine storm. This is what explains what the research was showing when animals originally get the vaccine. And then when exposed to the real thing, they ended up getting a cytokine storm. So part of the Hoskins effect is not just overactivation of the, uh, you know, the original epitope when you are exposed to something new, a different epitope, but it also has your cytotoxic T cells not lysing the cells that are infected by the virus. What the cytotoxic T cells do instead is overproduce inflammatory cytokines. See, there seems to be a theme here. Higher inflammation leads to, you know, further destruction of tissue. Well, th these, these, these increased cytokines from the cytotoxic T cells through the Hoskins effect adds to vascular leakage. Well, that's exactly what we were seeing with, with the, with the, um, with some of the vaccines and, you know, you know early days in New York that first wave, uh, you, know, the, you know, we had, you know, hemorrhages that were taking place and blood brain barrier issues. And there is such a thing as uh, the blood testicular barrier. So if that leaks, that leads to sterility. So all these things that people kept on saying uh, that, you know, that there, 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 there's possible mechanism I think what's happening here is, is it's through the Hoskins effect. We have antibodies to the corona, to beta coronaviruses. And that we, when we, when we get in, when we're infected either by the, um, uh, the real thing, the, the real SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus, for some people, their body is saying, create the old epitope the benign beta coronavirus, right? And not tool for the SARS-CoV-2. So for some individuals at the very beginning, they were seeing the Hoskins effect taking place and leading to the cytokine storm. It's activating, you know, I just told you about the, the, the cytotoxic T cell. So I, I see this as a, as a high potential. All right. So now we talk, now let's, now let's, let's uh, talk about the, the next, the next item here. And that's the, the syncytia. So that's multinucleation of cells. Now what I have seen underneath the microscope for necrotic tissues, now this is, you know, during, you know, our training in medical school, when you have areas that are, that are, um, somewhat inflamed and necrotic, you'll have cells that have a tendency to multinucleate. And the reason being is, is that those, those pro-inflammatory responses start to, to kind of degrade the, the cellular membrane and they fuse. Now they don't, they, they fuse and they, and they, uh, they normally build a multinucleated cell that's, you know, around four to six or eight nucleus, nucleuses, all right? But it doesn't make a hundred, it does, it's not a thousand. There's a, there's a cap on, on how far this, this, this leads, right? So I think this is where Celeste is talking about the gray goo and how the cells are kind of morphing together. Now, there's two ways that syncytia can happen. One is that the cellular membranes break down and they they merge with neighboring cells because of this pro-inflammatory response and degrade the integrity of their, of their you know, cellular surface. The other is, is through some sort of infection, a viral infection, 
And the proteins, the, the, the virus's spike proteins are transported to the cellular membrane and not to the Golgi apparatus. So these, these proteins, these proteins, spike proteins are normally created in the, the endoplasmic reticulum, the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So it's the endoplasmic reticulum that has the ribosomes. They package it there and then it's ported to the Golgi apparatus and then full assembly of the virus goes to be exocytosed or, or lysed, depending on what kind of virus it is. So in, in it, when a cell starts to break down because of stress, what happens is, is that that porting mechanism starts to go haywire and you're going to have um, um, a leakage from the, the, the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum, and those spike proteins will end up going to the surface of the cell. Now, it's questionable if it's a trimer or if it's a monomer. Some of them may be trimers and some of them may be monomers. But if you have the viral infection of SARS, not the vaccine, that's a different story. But if you have the viral infection of SARS, SARS-CoV-2, in a high infection situation, you're going to have those proteins port to the cellular surface and bind to the ACE2 neighboring cells in your lung and lead to syncytia. Now, syncytia was found in the early days during these high infection cases of SARS-CoV-2 in the hospital. Now, you know, so there, this is not like, like a, a, a theory or, you know, or just a, a possibility. There's evidence of this happening in high infection situations. Now, this ties, now that's the, that's the virus infection. Now let's talk about the vaccine. When you get the vaccine and it's making S1 subunits only, it's not able to have the S2 subunit to be able to merge into the cellular surface as well as just a normal spike protein. So syncytia, I don't see it, I don't see syncytia being a, a, a major issue with vaccines. I see other issues with vaccines in this conversation, you'll see it. But vaccines for syncytia based on spike protein at the cellular surface, uh, it, it, because it doesn't have the S2 subunit, very, very low probability that's what happened. What could happen though, is this vaccine creates a certain inflammatory response, AKA the Hoskins effect through the cytotoxic T cells, creating a high inflammatory response that leads to syncytia through just membranes attaching, not due to spike protein attaching to an ACE2 receptor from a neighboring cell. So syncytia could still continue here. Now, there is a debate. I was talking to George Webb. This is where I think he's wrong, but I, I could be wrong, but I think he's wrong on this, on this point. He's saying that through multinucleation that you're going to, if you had an infection of SARS, CoV-2, in one of these multinucleated cells, that it would produce more spike protein or if you had the vaccine um, vector uh, go into one of these multinucleated cells, then you would, it would produce more spike protein. Now, my understanding is this of necrotic tissue and syncytia, that the cellular processes are less efficient than the individual cells. So if you had six cells that were producing spike protein because they were infected, let's say the viral load is 1000 per cell. It's much higher than that, but let's just say it's 1000 per cell. So you have 6,000 viral products, virons. So in multinucleation, you're not gonna get 6,000. And in, in, in some people like George is saying, well, you're gonna get like 12,000 or 15,000. 
And so you're not going to get more because the cellular processes are breaking down. So you're not going to have the same machinery that to make stuff. So that, I think that's an important point. That is, that it's that it's this it's the way cells kind of kind of box things in when there's a problem. Now there's there's some other processes that are taking place. Neutrophils are coming in during this necrotic situation, and it's doing a interstitial entrapment. It's called interstitial entrapment, where it's kind of um, a releasing chemicals in the environment to prevent new vir virus from going beyond a certain border. So they're kind of like uh, the cleanup crew, right? So syncytia seems to me to be a, a, a potentially an, an emergent property or an evolutionary property to help trap you know, a, a necrotic situation, maybe, you know, bacterial or, 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 or a viral in, infection. That's my understanding of where I'm at in, 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 you know, my medical training now. So I don't believe that since this should becomes this, this spike factory, like some of these truthers are saying, and since doesn't lead to the gray goose syndrome because it maxes out at like about eight, or so nucleus it's it doesn't it's not a runaway train but it's an important feature that if you have a if you if you if you do have a high inflammatory response your chances of creating syncytia do increase all right and once you have this syncytia it's not like it's going it, to you know those 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 syncytial cells don't break apart and just turn normal again. It, it, it has to be completely cleared out. I mean, they, they're permanently like that unless they die off, unless the body finds a way to kill off the cell, it, it, it becomes necrotic. Um, now, how does that tie into ADE, antibody dependent enhancement? It seems to me that we have, we have antibodies that can attach to the spike protein on the virus. And that spike protein on the virus, some antibodies can help open up the binding domain or close the binding domain. Now, if it's opening it up and it's it, it, just enough, it could enhance its ability to attach to the different receptors, the ACE2, the CD209, the CD299, the GRP78 during high infection that's overexpressed. So that's another component of higher inflammatory response, maybe leading to more syncytia or more ADE. Um, so... So, the, so we have these attachments that open up the, the RBD and, and then it'll go into the cell and, in, 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 and help with the infection. So I think this is what's happening with the individuals that have the vaccine and why they end up getting higher titers after being exposed to Delta. So individuals have been, been vaccinated for the original epitope. This is the Wuhan, you know, original strain. And, and they, their antibody that they have kind of aren't neutralizing Delta. And because it's not fully neutralizing Delta, it's going into the cell and, um, uh, it, you know, there's now an infection that's taking hold, but it's not as bad as never having a vaccine because they have antibodies. It's floating around in their bloodstream and to retool takes another 14 days to make something to, to activate a naive B cell takes a, about 14 days, 12 to 14 days. That's why they say you have to wait 14 days because it takes that long to make these antibodies. Well, you're partially neutralizing, you're partially, partially neutralizing these, the, the Delta. And so the infection isn't as bad 
and because it's partially neutralized, it's sort of similar as those early cases before they were vaccinated and they were given the monoclonal antibody and they were able to clear the virus out. So now, so antibody dependent enhancement seems to be taking place with Delta. Now they spin it as breakthrough infections, but I think the real words that we should be using are the Hoskins effect in, you know, in the, in the cases that it's, it's actually happening and this antibody dependent enhancement. And then the question is, the ones that have taken the vaccine and get Delta and they test positive for SARS-CoV-2, they're neutralizing part of their infection and that virus is now replicating at a, at, at a at, uh, let's say at the, at the organ, organism level slower than let's say non-vaccinated individuals. Um, but what's happening is their titers are increasing. So the memory B cells are activated for for what their vaccine was tooled for. So the Hoskins effect is happening. And this is, this, is pro this is proof that the Hoskins effect is happening. The question is, is how much of the titers in the, in the blood serum are tied to just Delta as a percentage relative to let's say the original epitope. That I haven't seen any data on yet. So I think, you know, and when this, when this all happens, um, when this all happens, you know, this may, it, in those cases that are, they're still getting, let's say a pro-inflammatory response that, that is a little bit closer to the sepsis, it may lead to this syncytial issue where you have the multinucleation. And so that's, that's where my mind has been in the last, literally the last 24 hours. I mean, like, that's, you know, so that, so I, I don't know. I mean, what, what do you think, Dakota? I mean, what, I mean, from what you've been watching and what you've been documenting in your database, I mean, because what I'm doing is I'm taking three data points and I'm kind of connecting them together, together based on what the clinical presentations seem to be showing at the hospitals. Okay. Well, like you said, that is going to add another dimension to the database. Um, the what I've been seeing is that, what will we call it? The word on the street is mm -hmm. that anti -de antibody dependent enhancement is going to become a household word. Mm -hmm. And that that seems, I remember way back when it was thought that it was unlikely to happen with the uh, vaccine, but now, uh, as you explained so well, it, it, there's reason to believe that it could and that it is showing up. So as far as the uh, syntasia goes, you know, that is a relatively new concept for me. So, and, and that, since I, you mentioned it yesterday, I've been doing some research on it and, and adding that to the database. Um, the one of the things that comes to my mind, of course, is that the uh, these malfunctioning cellular blobs, there must be some reason or, or some mode by which the body is going to want to attack those and get rid of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that could be something that elevates inflammation and mm -hmm. cytokines and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the monoclonal antibodies, you were saying that early on they were effective, but what about now? Um, is, has something changed there or is that still a, a root? My consider? understanding is, is that Regeneron is just as effective for the original, you know, the, the, some of the earlier variants as it is to the Delta variant. Okay. And I agree, breakthrough. But, but, yeah, but we do know that the, the vaccines, all of them that are, have been administered in the United States, all of them have less efficacy on Delta, but the serial dilute, the, the, um, the serum dilutions for the IC50, you know, being able to inhibit the infection at, at, at the 50% level, 
seem to be adequate enough, but there's a debate on, on, you know, how valid is that? Because that's an out of body test. That's not an in body test, you know, that's, that's in vitro instead of in vivo. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, you know, these, these things are suited, they have pseudovirus, they're using pseudoviruses to determine if Mm -hmm. it's neutralizing the pseudovirus. So there's, there's some issue with, let's say IC50 serum dilution testing, but it, that is a common way to determine efficacy between different therapies. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if it doesn't make sense though, why in the Massachusetts data that was released in July, the majority of the cases were vaccinated group, not the non-vaccinated group. Right. So that's, that goes right in line with what Dr. Malone is saying mm-hmm. about antibody dependent enhancement, that it seems as though antibody dependent enhancement is creeping up through the Delta variant. Mm-hmm. And if the Delta variant is, you know, we're going to start seeing the, the creeping of antibody dependent enhancement. Well, you're going to have cases where you're going to have the higher inflammatory response and you're going to start seeing probably the Hoskins effect popping up, which, mm-hmm. you know, leads to, you know, further issues. And then the syncytia because of this high inflammatory situation. And uh, I, so now to, to answer, to, to answer your, you know, to, to just add to the comment that you had, the multinucleated cells is a way to kind of, this is how it deals with necr- necrosis and ne- right. necrotic tissue, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's not going through, it's not going through the normal apoptotic, you know, death phase, you know, mm-hmm. and it's, it's kind of stuck. It's just, it's kind of stuck in, it, in, in, now, I don't know about treatments of multinucleation. I mean, if there's pharmacological treatments to it, I don't, maybe there is, maybe it's not, but you know, I haven't gone down that road yet, but I do see that there, I do see, there was definitely evidence of, of multinucleation in the lungs of the high infection SARS-CoV-2 patients, for sure. Well, now another um, question, go ahead, did you have something else? No, no, go ahead. Um, now, lambdas or lambda is cropping up. Do you think that's going to be the same problem? I think that the, the variants that are that are popping up now, all of them have the high potentiality of be put into the category of antibody dependent enhancement. Mm-hmm. And if if you, if the Hoskins effect really takes hold, we're going to start seeing more syncytia taking place in the population. Mm-hmm. And the, and it goes back to it goes back to what I was mentioning with Gail earlier. The idea of vaccinating everybody with the same epitope is yeah. stupid yeah. because it's locking everybody in. Right. And it's even if, even if you can elicit naive B cells to retool for a new variant, it's not mm-hmm. going to be as robust mm-hmm. as if it was the original, as an original. And just for a population, you need to, it needs to be heterogeneous in terms of antibodies neutralizing different epitopes and not homogeneous. With homogeneous leads to the 1918 influenza pandemic. Right. And this all leads back to uh, paying more attention to the therapeutics mm-hmm. as a solution. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that is still way on the back burner from what I've seen. Mm-hmm. Although, you know, we have covered a whole lot that, that it works, but that hasn't been brought to the forefront. And I'm just wondering if and when they're finally going to realize that the therapeutics are where it's at. Mm-hmm. I, you know, it's like a multi-pronged approach, you know, there's like natural infection, mm-hmm. you know, and treated with the therapeutics. Then you have the, you know, the vulnerable that, you know, that, that may need to be treated with the vaccine. Um, you know, but, there's the, but, the, the, but that, this idea of everybody, yeah. and you know, like take it even one step further. They're even mentioning in the news repeatedly, the doctors are saying this, not just the journalists, but the doctors are saying, well, 
you know, once you get out of the hospital with Delta, you should get in line for that vaccine. Right. And I'm like going, well, wait a minute here. Yeah. Okay. Now, if you get the, you know, you already have the antibody. All right. Uh-huh. But, but let's just say that the Hoskins effect is not happening. You know, let's say that, you know, because it's, it's about, it's about dogma, right? It's about oh, absolutely. Med- med- medical dogma. So you're yeah. going to have a camp that says the Hoskins effect isn't happening. So every time I give you a vaccine, you're always going to have a new antibody that's, that's specific for that vaccine. All right. And then you're going to have, you know, individuals like myself. And it's like going, well, wait a minute, there is this, there is such a thing as the Hoskins effect and that you may be eliciting some new antibodies, but it's not going to be as robust in terms of the titers because you're also activating your memory cells that have a similar epitope. Now, you know, these, these doctors, they're all saying, oh, you know what, even if you had the infection, you need to get the vaccine. Now let's just work this through, you know, just brainstorming here. Okay. You get Delta and then you follow your doctor's advice. And after let's say four months, you take the, the, the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Now let's say the vaccine is tooled. Let's see, there's a new vaccine that comes out from Moderna for Delta. Okay. You take that vaccine and what's going to happen is, is you were exposed naturally to Delta and so one possibility is, is that it just boosts your booster titers. You know, it's just, it acts as a booster, even though it's quote a vaccine that's retooled for you because you had Delta, it's a booster, right? And it just increases the memory that, that you know, it, it activates the memory B cells and it creates more antibodies for Delta. Now that is, that should be somewhat okay you know, in terms of syncytia, in terms of antibody dependent enhancement, in terms of, of um, you know, of cytokine storms and all that. So it seems to be okay. So it acts as a booster. Now, if someone had Delta and they were given the current vaccine, that's the original Wuhan epitope, then what's going to happen if Hoskins really happening, they are going to elicit more antibodies for Delta and, and have maybe some antibodies, but at a lower titer concentration for the original epitope. Now, So it's not so, you know, there's, you know, we're working in the realm of the unknown here, you know, it's, you know, there's not, it's not so, so clear as, okay, if you get, if you had, if you had Delta and you're given the old vaccine, what does that do in terms of site, in terms of cytotoxic T cells producing, because your body your, your body is not, your, your body is being exposed to something's different, but is locked into a certain memory to a particular epitope. So this, in this case, an individual, that gets Delta naturally gets the vaccine, the current, the, the current epitope vaccine. It's possible that the cytotoxic T cells are activated and you get a cytokine storm. And then now, if that happens and the syncytia starts to take place and, um, you know, but antibody dependent enhancement could still, the, the Delta, the Delta antibody could still help with, let's say Lambda or some other mm-hmm. variant that comes down the road, just like what was happening today. I mean, yeah. we have, we have the original, it looks like the original epitope is from the vaccine helps with the, the infection of Delta in the vaccinated group, mm-hmm. but you're not seeing a cytokine storm. That's the, that's the thing that, you know, I'm trying to stick to the okay. data, yeah, so, yeah, you know, yeah. but you're not seeing, you're not seeing the ones that are vaccinated. You're not seeing the cytotoxic, the cytotoxic runaway effect of, you know, producing cytokines. You're seeing less infection a severe infection that's going to the hospital. 
for the vaccinated group, not the, va the unvaccinated. Well, that group. depends on where you look. You know, the, the information coming out of Israel, for example. Well, that's a good that, point. That's that a the good major, point. The majority, that's a, uh, the majority that's a good. of the hospitalizations and even deaths were for the vaccinated. Right, right, right. No, this and, is a good point. This is a great point. This is why I wanted to have this conversation because it's, it's hard to just, you know, think through it by yourself because you have to bounce ideas with other yeah. people. Yeah. So my kind of the control group for a almost almost fully vaccinated population is Israel. Right. And they almost exclusively use only two different types of vaccines. And it was primarily, my understanding was it was primarily Pfizer. Right. I think so too. Right, right. But it, not everybody had Pfizer, but primarily it was, it was Pfizer by, by, you know, 80 or more percent or whatever. So, okay. So if... All right, so they have a pretty strong, strong. They're 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 really good control group to understand what's going on here, and with Delta, they were getting sick. Yeah. Now that they were they were contracting it and they were testing positive. Now, what's your understanding of Israel's hospitalization rates? Well, I would have to look at the database for the actual figures, but um, it was very it was very high. Like they were. First of all, I think it was, and this is from memory, about 95% vaccinated. I mean, it was super high. Right. And the figures were some, somewhere, and again, I could be wrong. This is from memory. It was about 80% of the hospitalizations were for those who had been vaccinated. Did you see Zelensky? So that's it. Yeah. So this falls right in. No, I didn't see the video, but I know what you were talking okay. about. But this it's this good. falls right in line with what Malone and I were were talking about. Is the antibody dependent enhancement mm -hmm. is taking place with yeah. Delta? Yeah. Now the problem in this country is that the data is not handled very well. Uh, a lot of it is. I've I've seen that there's a lot of backlog that they haven't. There's so much they haven't been able to process it. Well, I'm starting to think that they're lying too. And that too. Was, well, that yeah. too. You know, I've seen um, information about in theirs how they've been deleting the uh, some of the deaths and things like that. And so, to get good data out of this country, I think is, you know, it's it's just a nice wish, but I wouldn't expect it. You're gonna have to look. In fact, there. I think Denmark and Norway are coming up with good data. Uh, of course, Israel has provided. Other countries are doing a better job of tracking and analyzing and providing data on this. So mm -hmm. that I think we could save a lot of time and headaches by just going directly to those sources. Apparently, there are other databases that aren't available to us. You know, the theirs is the publicly available. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there are, I think, 11 other databases that we can't get into. And that's probably where all the goodies are. Right, 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 right. So it's a guessing game. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of like... Wonder, I wonder through medical school if I have access to some of those things. I don't know. Yet. I'd have to look. Um, now, now, so Israel, just as we're just brainstorming, Israel does seem to be a good indication as a data point that antibody dependent enhancement is happening and that in that that part of that process is the Hoskins effect. Another part of the process could be that it's, you know, the actual antibody attaches to the spike protein and it helps with the RBD to the ACE2 receptor or the other receptors and, and, and help, you know, and helps it that way also. But um, it would be very interesting if that, if to know their blood work, if that cytotoxic T cell is, is producing more of those cytokines, the pro-inflammatory pro cytokines that may lead to, because that's one element of the Hoskins effect. Right. And when that does happen, then you're going to have the vascular leakage, which has been you yeah. know, mentioned multiple times with the vaccinated group and also the, the infected, you know, just natural infection group. Um, 
and you get this kind of like runaway effect that leads to, you know, that, that for some people it can, you know, lead to clotting and death or, or even, you know, you know, blood brain barrier issues. And there's some cases of the sterility. I don't know how prevalent it is. I, I, I don't think it's prevalent. I think it's more prevalent in these cases where you have the high vascular leakage, you know, it's probably more prevalent that you're going to have ham, you know, hemorrhages, blood brain barrier issues, um, clotting because of the, you know, the, the, the pro-inflammatory response that's going on there. I think that also this, this, um, cytotoxic, uh, T cell mechanism, maybe, maybe I need to research it some more but maybe one of the vectors for the myocard, um, the myocarditis, um, you know, there's this, it seems to be tied. You have these, but the thing is, is it seems to be more prevalent with children than let's say adults. But they, so have more stronger, like a, like, they have stronger is, immune systems too. You know, having a strong immune system isn't necessarily an ally. It could cause well, that's a good point. You know, that's a good point. You know, strong immune system means that you have, you, you can, you know, well, that, we need to define what strong, it's not a very scientific term, strong immune system. What does you know, strong I'm immune doing, system really mean? I'm, <laughs> I'm doing a video on that right now. It's, I'm in the process. Well, it, right now, it's still kind of vague of a, how can you tell if you have a strong immune system? I'm at that level with it, but mm -hmm. But, you know, um, is it, you know, is it, you know, is a strong immune system meaning that you, you know, you, you've been exposed to many different pathogens and you have a lot of memory B cells that, you know, that can, that can be activated if exposed to those pathogens again. I think um, of it more, that's one way. I think of it more as um, a, an immune system that is responsive in a way that doesn't destroy you, <laughs> you know, a, a, a mm -hmm. a, an effective and responsive. But it's not system. clear, yeah, yeah, but it's not clear, let's say healthy individuals yeah. versus unhealthy individuals. Right. What happens in the Hoskins effect? Right. So I don't exactly know. I mean, you know, it's not, you know, you know, let's say a good immune system may not necessarily lock itself into a particular epitope when it's initially exposed, but it could be that a good immune system does, right. you know, well, yeah, we don't know. <laughs> I don't, we, I don't we think don't, anyone, we don't, we're, we, I don't we think don't, these, these, yeah, we don't study in, in medicine. We don't really study the healthy. It's the pathological states that get all the attention. And so that's another Avenue. And I hope that that will change and there's more research done in to what's going on with, with health, you know, cause it is still kind of vague. Yeah. So Gail, what do you, what do you think? You know, you're listening to this, you know, and yes, you, you know, you, you know, and then, you know, you, you, you know, you know, what happens to children and individuals that have been, you know, that have immune issues either through vaccinations or, you know, through just genetics or whatever. I mean, when you're hearing all this, what, what's your, some of the, the key takeaways you're seeing? Well, the first thing is that I'm understanding that it sounds like the, how do you say it, sin sinestia? How do you say that words? Sincitia. I think it's pronounced sincitia. Sincitia. Um, and the ADE and the Hoskins effects that they are, sorry, my plate, pages are flying around. Um, they are... I mean, it just sounds like based on what you're saying that they are causing those that are vaccinated to have a, a worse situation. Um, one thing I wanted to bring up uh, besides that is when we were talking, someone was wondering about if there's anything to block, how do you say it again, sensitia? Sensitia. So uh, in this Nature article that I found uh, from May 12th, it says among the sensitia blocking drugs, and I'm going to mispronounce this because this isn't my field. Niclosamide, an oral anti-helminthic agent, was found to be effective at a very low dose, and it gives the dosage, and could prevent cell from virus-induced cell death. Uh, Niclosamide is a potent antagonist of CA2 plus activated 
TMEM16, you know, goes on things I don't understand, a family of chloride channels, and that this TMEM16F was also dramatically increased in vero cells upon spike protein expression. When the TMEM16F expression was disturbed, the syncytia formation in spike expression cells were diminished. Therefore, TMEM16F activation is the signal responsible for triggering syncytia. So I don't know if that means anything to you, but I just, I wanted to make sure that I mentioned that because it was, I purposely highlighted it when I was researching before we came onto this discussion so I could understand the topic a little bit better. And uh, some other things to mention are that uh, there is a member in the Freedom Restoration Foundation group that I am a part of, along with Greg Allison, and I'm not sure if you're still on the board, Paul, a few of us, um, that very unfortunately, that member's daughter took the vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, and from what I was told, it's only 19 years old and is in a wheelchair, and uh, that there were blood in the organs and such, and I just... Mm -hmm. We, we found well, that this is it. This is that what I was saying is that you know you have these you know you have this vascular leakage that can that can be catastrophic, you know, and cause a whole bunch of you know a whole bunch of situations. And in virus, there is a lot of that. It's not. I mean, it's not uncommon, you know. So, so you know, there's it's causing you know this kind of like very pro-inflammatory response. But you know, the thing is, is what. The, you know, what's, what's activating it? Was it a prior beta coronavirus? You know, and it, it falls in line with this, this, this whole Hoskins effect, you know, and then the vaccine activates it, you know, activates this pro-inflammatory response. Um, like they're trying to create the situation that they, tried to forecast with event 201. It, it sounds that way. I mean, I could be just going on a limb, but if we're talking about the syncytia and the ADE and the Hoskins effect and how this could bring about something far worse, I mean, it, it, it's like they want, I don't know, I'm just assuming. Based on well, I just think, I do yeah. think that the medical community, because of their dogma, have a tendency to have hubris and make huge mistakes. I mean, you know, without knowing or delving into, let's say, syncytia or the Hoskins effect, if their th thought is vac you know, vaccinate everyone to neutralize the, vac the, the, neutralize the pathogen, then the dogma would seem to be somewhat correct. But the thing is, is that that doesn't seem to be what's really going out in the real world. Or you have individual, data, you know, they, you know, right. Well, that's the thing is, is that, mm -hmm. you know, they, they're, they're so good. But can you imagine? Higher. Well, yeah, but if you can imagine, let's say the scientists are saying, you know what, maybe our dog mess, you know, is, is wrong. All right. Can you imagine how, how do, how does the CDC get up on stage or Fauci get up on stage and say some of the things that we're saying? It doesn't digest well to the, just to the general public. And therefore, no one's going to want to get vaccinated. It decreases the trust. See, trust is yeah. everything. And if you don't have the trust of your nation, then <laughs> you're going to have some big problems. Well, yeah, you know, I, I think one of the areas of distrust is that the, and I don't know if this has changed, but that the ingredient inserts in the vaccines are left purposefully blank. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that people need, including the doctors who are administering them, need to know what's in the vaccines. Because right now we're just talking about what's in them that uh, you know is designed mm -hmm. for the uh, antibodies, but there are always adjuvants. And what are the adjuvants in this one? Now, one of the things that's been popping up a lot is, and this may not be in all of them, is the presence of graphene oxide. What do you have to say about that, Paul? Well, I've done two videos on the, on the graphene oxide. Okay. My take is on the, the my, it's on Brighton. My take on this is that there, I don't think all of the vaccines have the graphene oxide in it. The ones that are making the statement that it's 99% graphene oxide, anyone that's worked with carbon knows that if you put carbon in water, you're going to get it very dark. 
dark color or, or gray in the solution. So if it was 99% graphene oxide, the solution would not be clear. It would be right. black or right. really dark gray, mm -hmm. right? So that, that's one problem with, with the ones that are making this statement. But, but there is research that's, that flat out states that graphene oxide in large flake form and in small flake form can be engulfed by macrophages and um, help with the APC process. So the antigen presenting process. So I believe the graphene oxide in very low concentration is either embedded in the lipid nanoparticle mm -hmm. or is in solution with the lipid nanoparticle and it acts as a means for um, integrating the vaccine particle into the cell, right. specifically to the APC to allow for presentation on MHC. I have papers and and on so that. I think so I think so I and so I so it's like an adjuvant you know it right. it, it helps it it helps with the it, it helps with the the integration into the cell and it, and it's also helping with the the inflammatory response for our adaptive immune system to create antibodies. So I do think it's in low concentrations mm -hmm. in some of the vaccines. And the reason why you're not seeing it on the list is because it's at such a low concentration, right. they don't legally have to show it. So I, have, I think that's- uh, Paul, I, have a, I have a section in the database on the graphene oxide where I've pulled out papers discussing it and how it is present in the lipid nanoparticles and, and some of the research I found shows that there can be toxic effects of it. And so that is just another thing to throw into the mix. Well, well, you know, here I, I, in my video about the graphene oxide, there is called uh, endotoxins. Now, mm -hmm. the, now, there was some papers they were talking about graphene oxide could elicit, you know, elicit these, you know, these toxic effects. What they have found out, it's not necessarily the graphene oxide that's, that is producing the toxic effects. It's the way the graphene oxide is made. And that uh -huh. if it's not made in its purest form, you have the endotoxins that are associated uh -huh. with graphene oxide. So it's not necessarily graphene oxide per se being bad. It's how it's made. Now you got to go back. Who's making some of the um, the, the starting ingredients for the lipid nanoparticle, mm -hmm. China, the, yeah. the, the peg 2000 mm -hmm. and the graphene yeah. oxide is being made in China. Well, if their process is not quote pure enough, mm -hmm. you may have yeah. endotoxins that are associated with the manufacturing of the graphene oxide. Well, here's, an so there's that point. action. Here's an interesting point that I just saw yesterday that the vaccines they're using in China are not mRNA va vaccines. Right, they're, they're using, that? right, right, right. The they're Sinovac using... and Sinopharm are using the inactivated vaccines, mm -hmm. the inactivated viruses. Yeah. Now they're not, you know, you know they're not, um, I'm not so sure that the Chinese can make a functional messenger RNA vaccine. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the reason why they went down that road. I think and that there's, they, there's they a level of complexity, ours. right? And there's okay. a level of complex, there's a level of complexity that I think that they're just not there yet to be able to make it. Now in my notes, in terms of the graphene oxide, um, uh, so there's TNF alpha, that is downregulated. That's pro-inflammatory. That's, that's pro-inflammatory. So, so the graphene oxide, Downregulates TN, TNF alpha. All right. Now, but it also downregulates um, interleukin one beta. And so there's kind of like there, there's kind of what what 
it's 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 kind of like the messenger RNA platform from Moderna had to fly underneath the, the innate immune system to be able to code for the, the spike protein in the cytoplasm or in the or in the um, endoplasmic reticulum. All right, so you have you, you, they had to create proteins. Well, we have a we have an innate immune system through activation of pro-inflammatory cytokines that will say I've been infected and natural killer cell or cytotoxic T cell kill me. So I think the graphene oxide and other things that they have done for the messenger RNA molecule have a tendency to downregulate the innate immune system to, to allow for that, that protein, that spike protein to be manufactured. So the graphene oxide may be helping in that regard, not just the, not just the, the inter internalization into APCs, but to just kind of keep that inflammatory response in the cell low enough to allow for the vaccine to manufacture the spike protein to el elicit an adaptive immune response. Now, another point that you've made before that I think you need to kind of briefly touch on here while we're on this topic is one of the confusing points to a lot of people is uh, how the spike protein is being made in the cell and how some of it could escape, so on and so forth. We're talking about what the vaccine out, part? Or, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, the yeah, vaccine? yeah. Okay. But, yeah, yeah. But the point you made is that it's only the S1 mm -hmm. that is being produced and that mm -hmm. in and of itself is, and this is what I think needs clarification. If the S1, okay, that's not a functional part of any virus. That's just like one little piece to... Uh, that's the binding region of the spike yeah. protein, right? And that and that's to to train the immune system, right? And so the question is, if that part escapes from the cell for whatever reason, because the cell is breaking down, whatever, um, even though it's technically not a functional spike protein in the sense of you know, being a trimer, or, you know, having the S1 mm -hmm. and S2. Mm -hmm. If that's in the body floating around at any level, it seems to me, and I'm just kind of guessing at this, that the immune system would take a look at that and go, ah, foreign stuff. And um, that, that it could react to that poorly. So what's your take on that? Well, you got to remember that these cells are in a, in a tissue matrix and outside of the cell is the interstitium. Right. So when you have quote leakage or proteins being excreted out, no matter, even if it's a spike protein, the, 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 the immune system will surveil and have the macrophages come in and eat that up. Right. So it cleans it, it kind of cleans up the interstitial tissue. Now we yeah. can work through, you know, uh, you know, several different, you know, scenarios, not all scenarios are equally probable, but one scenario is this, that you have the spike protein S1 subunit leak out and it just, just sits there, does nothing and just sits there. Another scenario is, is that it activates, you know, your, um, your innate immune system and it just, you know, cleans it up. It just has these macrophages eat up the, the debris. Um, there's another scenario where you may have an ACE receptor in, in a neighboring, in a neighboring cell. And that, that a receptor, these two receptors, but even if it internalizes, chances are it won't even internalize because you need 
more of the spike protein to help with the internalization. But even if it was internalized, because some receptor be internalized and recycled, and then you know new ones presented, it, it, it's like a conveyor belt. The mm -hmm. receptors just don't just stay on the cell surface. They kind of right. they recycle. So even if it was attached, um, you know it's it you know it can it, it and and gets internalized for whatever. Um, it's not going to do much because what's going to happen is, is the in, internal of the cell is going to say, Oh, foreign, I'm going to eat you up. This in, in the cell, we have mm -hmm. lysosomes and peroxisomes that will just eat up stuff. Right? right. And this is one of those things that would eat, eat it up. Now, if it touched a receptor and the question is, would it activate um, uh, cellular pathways that the ACE2 receptor is tied to, it might, you might have, you know, you know, like for example, you have angiotensin two converting enzyme is the ACE2 receptor. Well, if you have ACE, if you have a lot of spike protein that happens to attach perfectly to the ACE2 receptor, it may act as a ACE2 inhibitor, which, it, you know, you know, and that's, you know, part of the treatment of, you know, cardiovascular, some, you know, some, some high blood pressure, you know, cardiovascular issues. So, but that would be at a very, very low concentration. We probably wouldn't even be perceptible, mm -hmm. you know, at, at the organism, organism level, but the individuals are saying, oh, it can leak out and it's going to be a runaway, you know, causes a, you know, a bunch of, you know, a negative cascade effects in the body. I don't believe it for a second. I think the, the most highest probability is, is that you're going to have macrophages that, that will just eat up the debris. Um, and in some cases in the lung tissue, you may have some attachment to the ACE2 receptor of neighboring cells, but it's going to be benign and, and just eventually clear out. It's like, as if they gave you a, a drug, all right, your body will clear it out eventually. Right. So the That's same it thing. Does its thing. Yeah. Yeah. But the thing, <laughs> yeah, but the thing, yeah, but the thing is, is that it, it, you know, but the thing is, is that your, your body has a mechanism to clearing out proteins that come from cells release proteins. Cells make right. proteins for internal right. use. Cells create stuff uh, and exocytose. Normally it has a binding protein and the binding protein helps to kind of protect it from degradation. Well, there's not going to be a binding protein for the S1 subunit. So it, it adds to the probability that the macrophages are going to eat it up. So, so I, I've never been worried about yeah. S1 subunit leakage. Never, right. not, not one. I am worried about syncytia. I am worried, but that, yeah. that's a totally different, that's right. a totally different mechanism, totally different thing going on here. Mm -hmm. I am very worried about antibody dependent enhancement. Right. And I'm very worried and about the idea of the whole population converging to the original epitope of SARS-CoV-2. And it may lead to a larger pandemic when mm -hmm. other variants come online and are right. naive B cells don't tool for that new variant. Well, I think it's important to uh, recognize that while all kinds of things could go wrong, that and we have plenty to choose from, that we need to identify those which are the greatest risks. And mm -hmm. antibody independent enhancement yeah. is right on the top of the list. Yeah, and so given that, and since none of us have infinite time to learn and research in all of this, including the scientists who may be more or less interested uh, to focus in on antibody dependent enhancement could be a, a use of our time that's well worth it. And um, so that gets us to the issues of, again, therapeutics for something like that, because should somebody have it, obviously we're gonna want solutions. And um, part of what we've talked about all along is uh, lifestyle and, and various strategies with natural products that help keep inflammation under control. 
And um, so I think that just as a basic underpinning, that could be helpful. But what do you think about those approaches in regards to somebody actually developing this um, ADE? Is it well, lessen the risk or it doesn't matter or like, is it preventative or could it be? I don't, you know, the thing is, it's like, you know, well, there's different levels of ADE, right. you know, when we're, when we're given, when we get a virus, when we get a virus or we are given a vaccine to produce an antibody to some, you know, piece of a virus, our antibodies aren't like monolithic they're all they're they're, they're, you know they're they you're going to have some antibodies that will be very strong binding in some region of 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 this epitope and then you know a little bit weaker binding in other regions so you may let's say to make it simple you get a vaccine and you may actually have three different types of areas that you your body said oh i'm going to tool for for this for this spike protein um, one of them may be really good at neutralizing and the other two may help with antibody dependent enhancement. Now, you know, antibody dependent enhancement can just change the, 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 the now the antibody dependent enhancement may not necessarily be for the actual one that you tooled for the epitope that you mm-hmm. tooled for. Right. It's a new variant that your body hasn't seen yet. And so, the you know the idea is the the idea is can you prevent antibody dependent enhancement? Uh, right. I don't really think you can because you don't know what variant is coming down down the road. Now the idea here is is that if you have a healthy quote a healthy immune system, and the question is what is a healthy immune system? Mm-hmm. But but you know but if you have a healthy immune system, a robust immune system, then you you have a better chance of clearing out the virus and not having it take hold if if you're not you know if you're not chronically inf- you know, chronically inflamed and have you know chronic illness if, you know the comorbidity is a big problem but if you don't have comorbidities if you don't have you know chronic you know a, a chronic inflammatory situation in your body your body will have more energy to fight the virus this new variant that pops in and lower your chances of, let's say, antibody dependent enhancement. But there is no, there's no like cure all saying, oh, okay, uh, you know, if you do this protocol, you're going to prevent antibody dependent enhancement because you don't know what, what antibody you created that may help morph the topology of the spike of the virus to get, uh, get higher affinity to the receptor it's going to attach to. Now, you also have the antibody dependent enhancement issue where it's about titers and it's not so much about actually attaching to the spike protein and changing the topology and giving it affinity. It's you have low titers, it's not neutralizing and therefore the ones that, that escape the neutralization ends up infecting cells, that new variant let's say Delta ends up spreading in the body, um, albeit maybe not, not as fast as someone that's unvaccinated, but it's spreading around the body and it's taking time for the naive B cells to be activated 14 days after infection. While, while your, you know, your memory B cells basically get activated, you know, within 48 hours. So, or maybe even quicker, but, but it's much quicker response. Now, antibody dependent enhancement is not necessarily always a bad thing. And this is where, you know, here's another complexity that's added to this. Antibody dependent enhancement may be a, an emergent property of evolution to, to help with herd immunity. Now, you know, we got to get out of the realm. You know, I know, I, I know for a fact that this is a weapon. All right. There's, the virus is a weapon. I don't believe the vaccine is a weapon. All right. But the point I'm making about antibody dependent enhancement is, is that before modern science, 
there were viral infections and there were Hoskin effects that were taking place for, you know, for certain groups that were exposed to an, you know, an, a, a particular version of the virus and then exposed to a new version. And then they, that secondary infection was way worse than the first infection. And we explained the mechanism now, but the antibodies helping with the enhancement of a new variant and you have memory cells helping slowly neutralize the new variant. And those cases aren't as, as severe versus the naive cases. It's, and you, and they, and those, those individuals are shedding the virus. You're kind of, you're kind of like having it burn through the population and eventually leads to herd immunity. Now we have to look at it in the context, antibody dependent enhancement, we have to look at it in the context of what was it like before modern medicine? What was nature doing? And I think the antibody dependent enhancement in the short run is negative and in the long run is actually positive. And when you try to explain that to someone, they're just, their head will just spin around and around and around and say, huh? Because it doesn't seem as, you know, people are used to, is it good or is it bad? Black and white versus there's the- Yeah, crime. right. They're, and the thing is, is that nature created something, all right, they had a, popu they had a population out there that, that it was infected. They end up getting antibodies, all right? And you have another group that, that uh, didn't, ha didn't have it, didn't have the infection, a new variant pops up and the naive group, it's more severe. So there's selection pressure to kind of like maybe part of the attenuation process in nature is antibody dependent enhancement. It's, it's the, 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 the ones that have been infected that has antibodies, they're, per, they're, they're, they're kind of, um, they're, they're kind of like helping burn, help, helping push the virus through the population faster. And by helping push the, it through faster, it, it's getting antibody, natural antibodies created where if a new variant pops up, it'll be less severe. And then you start seeing the attenuation. I, I, maybe I don't make any sense, but it makes sense in my head. But there's, you know, it's, it, it, the ADE may be an emergent property pre-modern medicine to, for really bad infections, really bad pandemics, or in, 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 in the olden days, we really didn't really have pandemics. I mean, they were more like endemics because populations didn't really travel. As I'm, I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of years ago, you know, there's a mechanism in place to allow for, to allow for antibody dependent enhancement. I think it's an emergent property. Now you add in modern medicine and population densities and force vaccinations. And, you know, then what was an emergent property in nature that actually helped for attenuation and herd immunity in the short run may actually be detrimental to us. So what was natural out there may actually be, I don't believe that someone in the lab, I don't believe someone in the lab said, okay, we're gonna design something that's gonna have antibody dependent enhancement. I think it's too complicated for that to happen. But I do, you know, if we look at the data, if we look at the data in the United States, it's in assuming the data is correct, which there, yeah, that's suspect. Antibody dependent enhancement for Delta with the vaccinated group seems to be less severe. Now, if you look at the data that's in Israel, well, you are, you are seeing it pop up where you're having hospitalizations. Now, why are we seeing data that seems to be antithetical to what we're seeing in the United States? Is there something unique? 
Well, the Jewish population is there is genetic drift. Is it have to do something with the genetics? Is it have to do some with, something with the population was vaccinated roughly at the same time? It, 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 roughly with the same vaccine. You know, I, 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 there is something to be said about, you know, pluralism, you know, with the hetero, you know, this hetero, this heterogeneous um, population dynamics. If everything's the same, it may cause problems. Nature wants diversity, right? And so there's going to be some, you know, some sort of an emergent property that's negative that may be popping up in Israel because it's homogeneous. There's there's there a dominant there's, blood type in the, Israel. Uh, well, I don't know about blood type, but I mean, definitely, you know, you know, there's genetics. I mean, the, the Jewish people, it's a small group, right? I mean, you're only talking about, you know, 20 million or I mean, 25 million, right? <laughs> so, and the way the religion works is, is that, you, you know, a Jewish person is, you know, is propagating with an, an, another Jewish person typically. Mm -hmm. And so they beget a Jewish child, right? Mm -hmm. But you, you, you have a small pool, so there is genetic drift. And that's why Tay-Sachs disease and, you know, other Ashkenazi diseases pop up because of this small pool of people that, uh, you, know, you know, that have, you know, married over the centuries. Now, is there something to deal with the genetics that causes, let's say, these, this situation that we're seeing in the data with the vaccinated group? I know a lot of people that are, that are, that are Jewish. And, you know, the, the sad thing is, is that the diet for the Orthodox community is not a healthy diet. So that adds to the, the comorbidity issue. So mm -hmm. There's something you, I think that there's something to be said about Israel. And we need to dive into it and understand the comorbidity aspects, the unique genetic aspects because of just the eye of the, of, of, uh, of the, the, the law of marriage and, and, and how, you know, Jews are supposed to marry Jews and it, it stays within a certain bloodline. So, you're going to have genetic drift. They took the, roughly the same vaccine, roughly at the same time. So there's a lot of dynamics here. You know, it's I view the I, I view the is the Israeli the Israeli quote experiment here with SARS-CoV-2 vaccine vaccine program as very homogeneous, and that it's not you know and it, it, there and that's good in terms of a control group, but that may be the reason why we're seeing the higher hospitalizations. I mean, there's a lot of heart disease. There's a lot of heart disease in, in the Jewish community, a lot. Yeah. And that, that may have so. been preferred. Yeah, it could be. But also you have, like I was saying earlier, you're having similar problems in very different populations, like in Denmark and um, Norway and some of these other countries so well, yeah that's what that's yeah. where we can i think you know in comparing them assuming that their data is better than ours we can get some idea of that but um how does it help us you know but you know denmark is showing the antibody dependent enhancement yeah or the vaccinated group they vaccinate yeah, let's put yeah, it this yeah. way the vaccinated <laughs> group is being hospitalized yes, yes. and um, at and a as much I higher recall, percentage. Yeah. At a much higher percentage. All right. And yeah. so either they're really lying in the United States. <laughs> they're really lying in the United States. And Denmark had Moderna. Denmark was using. As I, the, recall, the, as I recall, as I recall, they're using that. I, I don't know if it was Moderna or Pfizer. I'd have to check. But okay. But it's an M. It's the messenger RNA plant. As I recall, yeah. Because what he is showing in this in the serum dilutions is that the messenger RNA platform does perform better than the non messenger RNA platform vaccines. That doesn't mean it is a better vaccine. It just says that it's, right. it has more antibodies <laughs> in, you yeah. know, and, you know, I keep on saying more isn't necessarily better. Right. right. Um, you know, because if you have more, you know, think about it this way, if you have more, 
you can build a case. Well, if you have more of this, then maybe there's more antibody dependent enhancement saving ways. Okay. Versus now I have, less. I, I have another question for you. These boosters, and I keep seeing things about how you're going to have to keep taking boosters for the rest of your life. Um, yeah. These boosters that are coming out, are they um, being designed for the new the variants as they're coming out, or is it just more of the same old, same old? Another no, no, my all right. So my understanding is this: the boosters that they're talking about, that if someone you know took the vaccine eight months ago. When they say booster, they mean they are going to give you the old epitope. Okay. So you're just eliciting the memory cells to produce more antibodies that you already created before and lost mm -hmm. over time. Now, Moderna is the only one that I have seen actually publicly announced that they were making another vaccine to a to one of the new variants. They didn't say which variant. And they said that they were going to release that in the fourth quarter of this year or the first quarter of next year. So there's two things going on. There's boosters that you're going to be hearing in the news. And then you're going to start hearing in the news that Moderna is now just finished their clinical trials for, let's say the Delta variant. Now, when they administer those to people that have already been vaccinated, to the old epitope, I suspect you're going to have more vaccine injury because of this Hoskins effect. Yeah. And then, you know, and then when, if you do have a high enough, a high enough vascular leakage and cytokine storm, you're going to have cases of this. this is the syncytia. Okay. Now, have you seen the recent announcement from Moderna and this harkens back to some of the early discussion that you've had, um, and you'll know why in a minute, but that they are coming out soon with an HIV vaccine. Well, yeah. See, this, is, this, is, this falls right in line, Dakota, of what I've been saying. The weapons yeah. program, the weapons program is a, is a three cocktail and a five cocktail. The three cocktail is the SARS, bad SARS with the HIV homology. Mm -hmm. The five cocktail is the scaffolding of the SARS-CoV-2, but mixed with the H protein and a fully functional HIV spike protein on a coronavirus. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they wanted this was this. You can, you can, you can magnify the Hoskins effect if you have an antibody on that you're developing on the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein and you release this five cocktail, your immune system will default to the memory of the spike protein and not try to create antibodies for the H protein or the HIV protein that's on the coronavirus. Now, so that that caught that that will that will elicit a hot, that, that that Hoskins effect even more so. Now, and this is what they were seeing with the H1N1 because the, the H is one type of spike and the N is a different spike on the influenza. So the more different types of spikes that you have, the more probability of the Hoskins effect. Now, with that said, the, the virus five cocktail is a weapon system to aerosolize AIDS-like syndrome to be able to attack the immune system directly. They couldn't aerosolize AIDS because it had to be transmitted through, you know, lick, you know fluid, bodily fluid transmission. So that's not a very good weapon system to deploy in an urban environment. Um, so I think what's going on here is, is that they're developing vaccines through Barrick's laboratory. And he already has NIH funding that, that took place between 2008 to 2011 or 2013, developing coronavirus vectors for the H protein 
spike and the um, HIV spike, which is the glycoprotein 120 with the glycoprotein 41. So it seems to me that they're going to be create, they're going to be releasing vaccines that are specific to research that came out of the barracks, barracks lab. They want people to be inoculated. Now this falls in line with the weapons program. They want people in the United States to be inoculated for the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, the H protein that's on the coronavirus that they developed, and then also um, on the, the HIV spike protein. Therefore, when it's dropped in the field and it goes around the world, the chances of it affecting the masses in the United States will be far less. The problem that took place with SARS-CoV-2 was it was released before our population were, were inoculated. And that was, I think that was because of the Chinese. It was released by the Chinese. And then it was, you know, and that and we, we were caught flat-footed. So now what's going to happen is we're going to start to take a covert operation in biologics at the DOD and now make it over and just say, you know, this is what, this is what is needed. They'll have some sort of policy. I'm not sure if they're going to spin it as, well, this is a health issue or if this is a national security issue, you know, because of let's say bio, you know, biological warfare. But they, the, I think the Pentagon and is, is, is thinking very hardly on inoculating the whole population for SARS-CoV-2, the H protein, and the HIV spike protein that Barrick's lab created. And you're seeing it in the news. You're starting to hear about it, well, the HIV I, vaccine. I, yeah, I put it in the database. You know, there's a section in the database under the coronavirus called News and Alerts. Mm -hmm. And all of the things that, are, that strike me, you know, I'm not putting every little thing in there, but the things right. that strike me as being very important go in that section. So that's where I put the article about, or maybe I put it in the Moderna. No, I put it, anyway, I'll tell, double check. There's a section on Moderna too. But no, the yeah, thing I is, is my, uh, coming you know, out with it. yeah, my, yeah, Soon. no, that's, and, and in the, there's several, I did, I did a, I did a video about the HIV vaccines that were popping around. Most of them failed. Most of the clinical trials failed. Now, Moderna has two versions of this. One, they're going to continue for clinical trials. The other one, I think, is just being put on a shelf. Mm -hmm. well, um, they were talking about coming out with it, like, either at the end of this year or early mm -hmm. next year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this falls in line with why I think that they... See, see in the truth, or this is, this is the problem I have, Dakota. In the truther community, they, a lot of them think that the, the, a lot of them, the ones that think that the virus does exist fall in the camp that I do that says that it's, it's, a, it's a weapon, mm -hmm. all right? Now the question is, if you are the president of the United States and you, and you have weapon systems coming online that are designed in your own laboratories and in your enemies' laboratories that are are um, you know tied to let's say SARS-CoV-2, influenza, and HIV. If you were the president of the United States, would you institute a policy to try to get as many Americans vaccinated against these potential biologics? Well, you know, you know and, it's and a hard here's the problem because yeah. because it's not natural. You know, it's it's. Um, and that's the big issue is that when you start creating bioweapons, um, the solutions aren't so easy to, right. you know, to, to identify. Because for one thing, you don't necessarily even know what they're going to do. Right. You know, so you have a population that thinks that the vaccine is the weapon or the vaccine is to try to call the, the, the population. I don't think that's the case. I think what it is, 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 is it's a vaccine program is a slow rollout 
to try to make sure that we have antibodies for each individual spike that was on the five cocktail. And, you know, I, well, that, I, does, that you know, doesn't, that doesn't make it harmless though, because no, you know, no, no like I'm not the, saying it. Right. Right. No, I, I agree with you on that. The intention may be good, but because you're dealing with a, a bioweapon, um, that's a whole new territory to be able to counteract mm -hmm. it, it, it universally is uh -huh. that is a whole new whole right. whole new area of and so many unknowns that um we can meet you know, you know going back to the whole spanish flu thing let's say we yeah. get inoculated for one spike of the five cocktail which is influenza and we do this in mass well that's priming us for another S spanish flu like scenario for the next generation mm -hmm. you know we're, we're you know we're 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 primed for a particular epitope which was a you know based on a weapon but nature has something out there too that can you know that that may not be in sync and therefore the hoskins right. effect takes place right so you know what you think that this is where the whole chaos theory comes in mm -hmm. where you know, there's an emergent property. Some emergent properties are good. Some emergent properties are bad, you know, and, you, you know, at the very beginning, the intentions could have been bad, but the emergent property actually ends up being good and vice versa. The intentions could have been really good, but the end result is very bad. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I think that's what's going on with the whole bioweapon and the force vaccine program. This is that this is setting in in motion, the ability to inoculate the population for quote biosecurity, mm -hmm. because biologics I think is going to be a, a major quote frontier for the military to use. Oh yeah, um, you know. So I'm concerned, yeah. Dakota. I'm concerned. You know, yeah. the, 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 yeah. you know. Sometimes ignorance yeah. is bliss. You know. <laughs> <laughs> You know, because, you know, we, we just, you know, walk through with our conversation, you know, some really important subjects here. What's just going on mm -hmm. with the virus that we're dealing with, but we're touching on some points about, well, this whole vaccine thing program may be trying to inoculate us for a, a battle plan that's already being hatched. Yeah. Which yeah. brings up the civil liberties issue, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this all ties back to the civil liberties issue. And, you know, and then having a government that's doing things they shouldn't be doing. This is why mm -hmm. I'm a, a proponent of the idea that we should not have these, these, these um, uh, Department of Defense groups, you know, making things that they shouldn't be making. I think this falls in line of crimes against humanity. Absolutely. You know, but That's the thing is, is that they, they're 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 in power and they have a lot of control and they they're in, they have hubris and they they mm -hmm. basically can do anything that they want to do. Right. And you know, yep. uh, you know, I um, and look at the disaster. That's not that the the, the whole conversation you know should go in the, this direction here, but but look at the disaster that's going on in Afghanistan. Yeah. You know, in terms of chaos theory, there's an emergence, there's an emergent property that you would thought that, you know, things were a lot better. Maybe the government was lying to us on how much the Afghani government could stand on its own two feet and protect itself, you know, and then everything starts to, to, to just disintegrate so quickly. You know, it, it, you know, and you have a, that, that same military mm -hmm. is making these biologics, right. which leads to this, 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 no matter how much they plan, it, it's most likely going to lead to a, a, a very poor outcome, you know, a negative externality. Yes. And that's why it, it's, it's like nuclear, it's like nuclear power. You know, if something mm -hmm. goes yeah. wrong, it goes wrong for 50,000 years. It doesn't go it wrong is. for like, you know, 10, 10 years or, right. I mean, yeah. right. You know, it goes, it goes wrong and it goes wrong really bad. 
this is something very similar. We're, we're having mm -hmm. laboratories in the Defense Department or tied to the Defense Department under the, under, under the, you know, under the umbrella of dual capability or dual research, dual platforming, you know, you know, where you have, you have multiple application. Yeah. You know, we're, you're, we're getting some, you know, basic science out of the research, you know, we're getting therapeutics out of the research, but also we have a weapon out of the research and that's, <laughs> they love this stuff. Oh, you know, so, you know, and eventually, you know, they use it. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I think it was used. Now the question mm -hmm. is, how do we get around this? There, there, there is in modern history, nothing like this has happened before. Nothing, nothing. And, oh. and, you know, and this, we're, I think we're only halfway into it. In the United States, we're only halfway into it. You know, this isn't yeah. going to end in, in one month. It's not going to end in a quarter. It's where we're going to see another flare up of another, another version and the complexities that, that we were talking about the emergent complexities that, that mm -hmm. happened with the Hoskins effect and the multinucleated cells and the antibody dependent enhancement, all these things mm -hmm. are going to start to pop up that adds to the complexity of it. Now, again, you know, antibody dependent enhancement in the long run may actually lead to herd immunity. And assuming, that, assuming that the antibody dependent enhancement doesn't kill the person that well, that's has the antibody dependent it, enhancement. Uh, it, it herd immunity among a much smaller population. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe. I mean, you know, we're not seeing large die-offs right now. Well, uh, I mean, I know, was expecting not, not a large... I was yeah. expecting, I was expecting in the, by, by the 18th month, I, I went public on this. I was expecting by the 18th month of the crisis that the United States would have, would have had 6.5 million deaths. But as just in the say, United States, but, as but it didn't say, happen. This, but as you say, this isn't over, you know. Well, that's and, true. That's true. And look but, at, look at what's happening to the medical field. You've got a lot of doctors and nurses walking out because they don't want to take the vaccine and there's already a nursing shortage. So you've got now a combination of a segmentation, a segmenting of the population, of course, into the vax versus the unvax. And a lot of those people that have decided to opt out of the vax are performing critical services, not only in the healthcare field, but other areas like the police, there's a police union you know, that's just come out and said, no, we're not doing this. And in fact, the Marines, the head of the Marines has just announced to uh, Austin that he's not going to force vaccine on the Marines. So they, they have freedom of choice there, but others don't. So you've got this crazy thing happening where the underpinnings of civilization could be rocked in a big way. You've got the third largest port in China closed down again and the, the supply chain is again heavily impacted and then there are crazy fires and floods affecting food production mm -hmm. and I mean it goes on and on and on so mm -hmm. with that kind of foundation and a bioweapon running loose I think that it's you know it doesn't look good but what it always comes down to it to my way of thinking is you know, we can't solve the big picture here ourselves, right? I mean, we, we want to understand it as best we can to be able to make informed choices for ourselves. But I think what it comes down to is, and I'm, I'm, I've always been kind of like a, a do-it-yourself grassroots granny woman. And so it comes down to learning some of the, even just the old time traditional basics about how to survive difficult situations and getting developing skills like people need to learn first aid. You know, they, they people need to um, learn how to live, how to create a healthy diet when there isn't much to choose from. I'll, 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 take it one, yeah, I'll take it one step further. I'm starting to see, and Gail and I have had these conversations. I feel as though society is just slowly dying. 
Well, that's what I, the, I yeah, yeah. You know, it's yeah. like it's breaking apart, you know, yeah, the efficiency of things are, are yeah, breaking yeah, apart. Yeah, it is. It is. And so when it's like that, you know, we have an opportunity right now before it gets really bad to pick up some skills that we may not have and to get together with other people because it's a lived, I lived alone in the wilderness for 10 years and it's not an easy thing to do it by yourself. You know, I always wanted to have other people with me, but no one could handle it. So I know what it is to be like, uh, you know, bare yeah. bones and, uh, you know, and it can be dumb. And it's not really that it's hard, but having other people around that you can be have so, as a mutual support system, that's important. So for that, you've got to have good communication skills. You have to good, have good social skills so you don't wind up hating each other. Because when people are under stress, they have a tendency to want to blame each other and things fall apart. So there's mm -hmm. a whole lot that we have to do for ourselves now. Don't look to the government to do it. And don't even look to the medical establishment to do it. Because um, I'm seeing things coming apart at the seams. And uh, you may have you know, here's the, what, you know, here's, when... you, what you're saying. It would it, it it gives me a memory of Lehman, and for me, every time these kinds of situations happen, it's best to go into the fire, not run away from it. I don't know why I have that kind of personality, but it seems as though we to to, to tackle this issue. We have to run into it. Wherever the source is, we have to run into it. Well, the natural reaction, the knee-jerk reaction is run away from the fire. So like when I was transitioning from automotive to finance, I finished my MBA in, um, in 2008. It was, it was in, uh, it was April, right? So this is in the middle of the Lehman crash, right? So I moved from Detroit, been an automotive engineer all my, you know, at that time, all my adult life. And then I, I'm, you know, I fly into New York in the middle of literally an asteroid hit Wall Street, right? That was extremely stressful and difficult to navigate through. But that was going into the fire, right? Something similar is happening for me in medicine now. The, you know, when I was, you know, when I was told by the school, you have to be vaccinated or you're no, you know, all students by August 28th have to be vaccinated or you're, you're not in, in registered, unless you have, you know, some, you know, provision. Um, but they, they, you know, so I, you know, sat down and I'm like going, okay, I'm halfway through. What do I do? Do right. I give up? and not be an MD right? or, you know, and, and, or, you know, persevere and that jump into the fire mentality of mine kicked in. So I chose the Johnson and Johnson for multiple multitude of reasons. A big part of it is this logistics, but on, on top of it, I didn't trust the messenger RNA long-term data is just not there. But when I did take the vaccine, I didn't have any side effects of it. I had more side effects when I had to take the polio shot doing the, the research that I was doing um, than I had with the SARS-CoV-2 shot. Now, maybe the reason for my lack of, of, of reaction to the SARS-CoV-2 shot was because I had somewhat of a reaction to the polio. And that may have kind of like mm -hmm. made my system better. Mm -hmm. Um, but knows? you're also taking you're also taking C60 and all kinds of good stuff. Yeah, right, right, you know, so yeah, you have yeah, to yeah, throw yeah, that yeah, in there. You know, but, I, you know, I took an anti-inflammatory protocol while yeah, I was taking these. Things. Yeah. So, but but, but to, to your point, you know, I'm sort of doing a similar thing, although in a different way. It's like uh, I've got the database, and I'm like full tilt into that to create the resource that people need to be able to access when they can't get into the hospital, when they need to, because it has first aid training in it, of course, it's great if you can be, you know, in a class, but it has all of those things in it. 
and I'm just pumping that thing like crazy hours and hours a day because it's some a resource that I think we're going to need so long as we have internet. Um, but there are different ways. It's like it's motivating a lot of people to go into different types of fires to, to become, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To become mm-hmm. very motivated mm-hmm. to take some kind of action themselves. Right. Exactly. And that's one of the good things about it because a lot of people are actually getting up off the couch. And they are well. Well, some are. Some are. The others well, are watching us while they're eating bomb bombs on the couch. Well, <laughs> y- well, yes. But then they're going to jump up and do something. But anyway, but there's, you know, education is doing something, as you well know. Uh, as long as you stick with it and follow the trail and and keep actually learning and not just, you know, passively taking something in that goes in one ear and out the other. But uh, I think that going in, I don't think you can escape the fire. Now, there are people who are trying to, and those are the people who are in denial, because denial is the, our, our way of attempting to escape what we can't comprehend or seems too much for us. And uh, those are the people I'm really concerned about, the people have, who are in denial. Know, yeah, yeah. I mean, my... My um, my rotation start, assuming I survive medical school, um, but you know, but the, you know, my rotation start at the end of uh, wait, wait, mid mid next year. Now I don't know which rotation will start first. If it's pediatrics, ER, I don't know yet. Well, you know, that's way too it's way too early to know that schedule, but you know, I have some trepidation as we move through this crisis, what it's going to be like in the middle of next year. Yeah. You know, yeah. and that was part of my calculus. It's like, you know, I can understand, you know, the risk that, the, you know, when you're a healthcare worker and you're, you know, you're, you're kind of, you're on the front line of, of, of caring for these patients your risk exposure is so much higher than let's say the average citizen. So right. the decisions to vaccinate or not to vaccinate yeah. is a different calculus because right. the risk factors are different. Right. So I, you know, I still think that nurses and doctors should have the, you know, their choice of what they, you know, want to do with that situation. Um, and you know, preferably they don't exit out of the field, but you know, they're exiting out of the field. It's not just this Dakota, they're exiting out of the field because of the institutionalization and the, the, you know, the, 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 the bureaucracy and the way the insurance companies work. So it's a lot of moving pieces here, Yeah, you know, and and, and it's, it's the, you know, it's the straw that breaks the camel's back. So I, 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 it's not rewarding without, right. If it's not rewarding and you don't feel like you're actually free to truly help people, why are you there? You know, other you, than money, but you know, you know, well, um, money is a big, big incentive for it for certain specialties, but yeah. you know, but a, a big part of it is, is that they, they're, they're, you know, they had a loved one that, you know, had a certain disease and they're trying to, you know, help people, yeah. you know, there, there's, there's somewhat of an altruistic component yeah. to their to their to their you know wanting to to be in medicine that's, i think that's a course. big part of it yeah but that but if they are hamstrung they discover that they can't help people they know what to do but the insurance company won't let them you know or mm-hmm. there's some hospital policy that is preventing them from doing what they need or they don't have the resources or short staffed and have um, bosses that are making their lives miserable you know that kind of thing i think i agree with you that is part that's there's been a nurse shortage for a while so this is nothing Mm -hmm. new Mm -hmm. well there's been a doctor shortage too in certain disciplines in certain areas of the country i mean like general 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 surgery they have shortages uh in in uh throughout the country throughout the united Mm -hmm. states um, mm-hmm. IMs, internal, internal medicine, 
that that okay. and family doctors that they you know they're they're in shortage too. Mm-hmm. Um, what's not in shortage are the dermatologists. You know, <laughs> you know. that's interesting. Yeah, you know, you know, so you know, you know, or the plastic surgeons. But you know, wow. they, you know, so you can see where the society is geared for. You know, yeah. it's a little bit more. You know, it's not so much about health; it's about you know just the the exterior beauty. Um, you know, I, but I, there is there is something. I, I have some trepidation. You know, I you know there's mm-hmm. like what's what is it going to be like in a, in the at this time yeah. next year. You know, yeah. and that's, you know, and I'm, you know, it'll be interesting because of how I've been covering this. I'll oh, have a yeah. better perspective at the bedside, what I'm seeing. Yeah, absolutely. That you will know. be invaluable. Yeah. 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 So, you know, it's like none of us knows what, what we have ahead of us. You know, it's like uh, there's a lot of trepidation all the way around financial, you know, I, I think the list is long, but the the main point of it is we have to uh, find out what works for us to be functional in the best way that we can and do that because we need to be functional and you know we had this talk last time I was on I was kind of trying to give my little pep talk about everybody yeah it looks dark but you know there's um, uh, it's been dark before and people have figured out how to overcome and get through the whatever was happening and serve others and as a result kind of kickstart another uh, period of history you know it's I, I learned about the fourth turning when that book came out and I've been watching for the fourth turning I don't know if you're familiar with that book I think it was in the 90s when I read it. And um, so what I'm seeing, and you mentioned Tim Pool sometimes, he's been talking about that book too lately. But what I'm mm-hmm. seeing is the fourth turning. And in the fourth turning, you know, it's, there's a, a periodicity to civilization. And in the fourth turning, the old is destroyed and it's very traumatic. And out of that, out of the ashes, something new arises and it's gen- generational. So I'm looking forward to the possibility that on the other side of this, there could be actually finally something that is new and not only new, but something that works better for us. So wait, so, the four turning ends up being a better system? Yeah, well, it's, it, it's, it's considered, you aren't familiar with that book? Mm-hmm. You might want to read it. It's quite interesting. It goes through history and shows a cycle of changes that occurs generationally. So there's generation one, which comes out of a disaster, let's say World War II. This and, ties into what uh, uh, there, there's a, I can't remember his name, but he's an Australian, he's an Australian doctor and he, uh, PhD, and he, he wrote a book about called Biohistory. And so yes. they, they, he, he correlated rise and fall of civilizations based on in utero stresses. Okay. Yeah. So, yes, it does tie in. So there's a generation, of course, it's not just in utero, but that is a part of it. Um, but it's also the, the civilization itself, the, the state of civilization. So things are torn apart. This is just an example. In World War II, things have been torn apart. Um, a generation then gets busy about rebuilding everything Mm -hmm. and you've got this period of great abundance and creativity and then the next generation that inherits that we get lazy they're the managers yeah they just keep it going and the generation that follows that begins to see some stagnancy and they don't want to just be you know that's that's interesting because when you when you think about that you think about all right, the greatest generation to get out of the war, you know, it's this destruction. And then there's that rebuilding effect that's taking place from, let's say, 45 to 75. Mm -hmm. And then what do you start hearing? What do you start seeing in universities? The MBA, 
Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. And then you have the managerial class and exactly. they really start controlling things in the eighties and the nineties. Yes. And so, and then, right. Right. And, and then you start no seeing room. the laziness. You start to see yeah. the laziness that, that takes hold around 92. Maybe well, I, I, there's a debate, you know, that yeah. whole like grunge thing that was taking place in, in music in the United States kind of well, is there's a it's the beginnings of what we're seeing today on the streets. Exactly. And so there's a reaction against that static managerial phase where nothing seems to be happening. There's no inspiration. And so there's a reaction. It's all about against... efficiency. It's a, yeah. they're, they're programmed and to just do efficiency. Exactly. And so there's a, the next generation has a response against that. They rebel. And as their rebellion grows and grows, they start to tear it apart. It takes a while, but it eventually ends in, and that's the third turning when they start to rebel. And then in the fourth turning, they finally done the job and destroyed things so completely that there is some kind of catastrophic or a series of catastrophic events that occur, which could be like world wars or, you know, and this is then traced back. It was traced back to the Etruscans and it seems to be a pattern that exists only in the Western civilizations because in the Asian civilizations have a, a different concept about what it means to be in civilization, et cetera. But then you have the fourth turning where things are just absolutely destroyed. And uh, that's what we seem to be in now. And out of that though, you know, it takes a while, <laughs> you know, unfortunately, but during that process, the seeds are being planted to recreate a better civilization and to rebuild. Yeah, but so, how long does the fourth turning take? 25 years. 25 uh, years? Uh, yeah. And well, we're more, just more starting or, the process? We're just yeah, starting well, more, the process? Yeah, more or less, yeah. However, you know, we don't know that this is according to historical records. That was before we had you know, this, this civilization is kind of different with what we have are available to us. But if, depending on how far it goes, you know, if, if the technology is no longer useful to us, it could be back to the Stone Age. I don't know. But well, that, that's... I mean, I get, I've been thinking that, you know, because of this asymmetric warfare that's starting to develop with biologics and cyber, mm -hmm. that the miscalculation of mutual destruction with nuclear yeah. weapons yeah. is... There, there's going to be, there's going to be a heightened, uh, there's going to be a heightened risk of nuclear detonation. There's going to mm -hmm. be a miscalculation, and I, you know, I see. I think we are in, in more dangerous times than, let's say, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. And so this is the fourth turning, and um, you know, historically, you know, it, it's a beautiful book. I think you would really enjoy it. It's called. The fourth turning, and uh, it it dates back these cycles to the times of the Etruscans, and it shows that roughly about every twenty five years, and then every fifty years there's another um, like major. It's like twenty five years, but then every fifty years there could be a major conflict or whatever. So yeah, that I kind of see it that way, and. Uh, so this is the time for planting, first of all, trying to keep as many people alive as we can and preserving animals and plants, et cetera, as best we can, but also be getting, thinking in terms of being creative about solutions to things and not just mm -hmm. caving in, you know. That's a, good, that's a good idea. So Gail, what do you think before we, we wrap it up? I think we need to build communities of like-minded people. <laughs> I always go back to that. <laughs> well, just kind of having smaller groups of people, not having everything so big scale managed from a higher level. Mm -hmm. and, uh, as always, I am supportive of ensuring that we have our civil liberties and that we make our own choices for what we're going to put inside of our bodies. And I am always supportive of using things like the supplements that you offer, in particular the ashwagandha in this case for what's going on, and essential oils, and referring to things like Dakota's database. 
Yeah, so we have tools. We just have to use them and uh, recognize the reality of what, you know, what we're facing, not be in denial and, and not freak out about it because, well, you know, okay, what can I do? What can I do today? And one of my new favorite things to do in the morning is to ask myself, and this is like a tone setting thing, how good can it get? Nice. How good can it get? See, when I wake up in the morning, it's more like how bad is it going to get? I know. It's <laughs> I mean, easy. It's like, to... For me, when I wake up in the morning, I, it's all about whole... gratitude. Honestly, <laughs> honestly, I mean, this year has been just one obstacle after another in, in so many fronts. I mean, it was just, it's just nothing has really gone smoothly at all this year. You know, yeah. it's, you know, and it's not that's even. Why you, that's why you need to, to start asking how good can it get and, and start looking for the little teeny nuggets of something good that happened to have be grateful for it because that actually does help to build the spirit that is needed to move forwards. Yeah. Yep. Gratitude. Yeah. Well, I'm great. Uh, I'm grateful to be with you guys right now. Likewise. I'm, <laughs> I'm grateful for all of the work that you have done. I hope that I get more database subscribers so that I can buy C60 from you because I think that's important. It is a little pricey, but I want it. And um, and I'm grateful to you, Gail, for all of the work that you've done showing people how to have not only good nutrition, but food that actually tastes good. And um, you're bringing over those great essential oils and your spirit. And, you know, both of you are, are absolute gems that I treasure. So I really? thank you for I, You time. know, the thing, you know, the thing is, I appreciate that, Dakota. I, I was told something very similar by Peter Duke. You know, he, he said that a, a national, he phrased it, Paul, you're a national treasure. And I, yeah. I said, I just don't feel it. I just don't feel that way. I feel as though it's just that it's just that it's just one war, you know, one battle after another, after another. And it's just well, so confusing. Paul, and it's just, Paul, you know, Paul, and it's Paul, like, Paul. I don't, I'm not enjoying my life. That's for You're sure. running into the fire, you know? No, well, that's true. That's true. <laughs> I chose it. That. Right, that's true. Right. right. No, that's true. That's true. But, you know, I just, but when, you know, when Peter and, and, and you say those things, it's just like, I just don't see it. I just see that there's just, you know, there's just so much to, there's so much to do yeah. to try to fix, but yet, you know. But, you know, what you're doing, what you're doing is helping a myriad other people to have a better grasp of this. You don't have to do it all alone. So the more people learn about, you know, the knowledge you're sharing, mm -hmm. that, and you have no way of knowing how they're going to use it, but you know that the message is going out. And that's what's frustrating to mo a lot of us is we're sending out messages of, of how, to, how to heal the situation, but, and people are receiving it, but none of us really knows how it's, what its practical application is outside of our own sphere. So we just have to kind of trust that right. part of the recipe well, I mean, is informing a... people. Right. Well, it, it, you know, you just have to trust it. You just have to trust that in just that, that whole chaotic aspect of nature. Yeah. Nature does well when it's just left alone, but it's a chaotic system. Yeah. It doesn't, you know, but yeah. well, I appreciate you, you calling in and, and Gail being on and, and, you know, it helped me kind of explain a little bit more about, you know, these three issues, the, the antibody yeah. dependent enhancement, the, the multinucleation and the, yeah. and the, um, yeah, you know, the you vaccine did issue. Yeah. You, you brought a lot the of Hoskins affection. Hoskins, yeah. yes. you, you brought clarity to that. And I, and thank you for that. Cause it's, it is dense. Yeah, no, no. And, you know, and, and it's an evolving, it's an evolving thought because as things moving on, See, literally what's happening is it's like we're recording our brainstorms. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, and it's like, and, and this is important because it's a, it's a way to document some things and, and, and what was the thinking process 
but I, I'm concerned about the antibody dependent enhancement and this whole Hoskins effect and, and where this is all going. But um, I, I appreciate, appreciate both of you calling in. So let me, um, let me stop the recording here. And then okay.